Thank you, Michael, for joining us today in the Power Entrepreneurs Podcast. My pleasure. So why don't you start out by telling us how you grew up and what got you into the business world? I am an immigration lawyer by trade. I grew up in the home of a legend in our field. Uh, my father, Leon Wilds, uh, when he uh, was president of the American Immigration Lawyers Association, uh, was one of about 400 immigration lawyers. There are about 16,000 uh, now, and I had the privilege uh, to go with him on Sundays to the office and hold his briefcase for many years, and God uh, willing, for many more years to come. We still practice side by side, and uh, he opened uh, his business doors to me, and I took it to the next level. Nice. So you started out, I'm assuming this was a family business. Your father started the practice. And what what was your initial you know, mindset when you got into this? Did you always want to be an attorney? What brought you into this? I just wanted to be with my dad. Mm. I didn't want to be away from him. I wanted to have time with him as a kid at night. I wanted to be with him during the week. He was Uncle Daddy because he always saw my mother in a house coat in the morning when he left and when he came back late at night. And if I wanted to spend more time with him, it had to be done uh, on his terms in the office because he was developing a prominent career and a robust practice. And that meant uh, going into the office. And I had that uh, uh, privilege only if I would do it on weekends because I was in school. And uh, I remember to this day sitting in a cold office because the heat was off on a Sunday. We'd be there 8 o'clock in the morning till 5 o'clock at night. I didn't have the capability at age 8, 9, 10 of doing more than cutting scrap paper, and I cut about thousands of sheets and then took on different responsibility as the years went forward and now manage uh, Dad's practice. He's uh, 86 years young, and what he started was one of the best entrepreneurial-spirited things that I encourage law students that I now teach uh, to do the same, which is to be their own boss and start their own uh, business. So what advice would you give for you know the lawyer who wants to start his own practice? Uh, dig in deep. Um, get some experience before you open your own doors so that you know how to talk to a client because when you walk out of one, two, three years of law school, you're not capable really of minding, grinding, and finding work. The talent in our space is to identify early on, are you a finder? Of relationships? Are you a minder of relationships? Are you a grinder of product? And until you've grounded and minded, you're not going to develop the skill sets to find. I had the luxury of being able to make my mistakes at the U.S. Attorney's Office as a federal prosecutor. I got about four years experience before I physically joined my dad's practice so that I developed my own sea legs, my own a sense of propriety and confidence so that I would bring something into the practice and then I hunkered down. And I, through my dad and other stewardship, had the opportunity then to see what it was like and what not to do when I would see uh, clients or staff or other people making what I thought to be pivotal marketing mistakes or, or substantive mistakes on the law. What are some of those mistakes? Not treating um, in a service arena the customer being right, um, taking charge and knowing your role, which is a humbled experience, wearing a suit and a tie and a jacket, holding yourself and standing when your father walks into a room and treating clients, whether they're rock stars, my dad was John Lennon's uh, immigration lawyer, or housekeepers, and making sure that you maintain your even keel. Uh, clients also do not like lawyers who don't opine and think out of the box. Saying to somebody, I only do immigration law isn't the way you want to uh, comport yourself. You want to be able to give a, a few sentences or a paragraph and then defer it to an expert in the arena, but develop your own narrative. There are people that didn't dig down deep into the space that they occupied, and they weren't humbled by the trust that a client uh, put in them. And you can tell by the arrogance of either their inaction or the lack of sophistication and the lack of responsiveness. These days with emails, you have no excuse not to be proactive. And when a client emails, I insist that I get copied. And if I don't see the staff moving, I'm double timing the email to make sure that they understand that they are the most important uh, part of the office. And that is reiterating to them that they are not a file, but that they are actually a journey, a person, and something uh, that is more important than the uh, ministerial functions that we have in our practice. So in a law office, you know, a lot of the people that come into law offices, paralegals, 
people that are not that experienced yet in that field. How do you go about making sure that you have the right people on your team and making sure that they do the job the way it's meant to be done? I really don't look at grades. I don't care what school somebody went to. I'm looking for body language. I'm looking uh, for skill set as far as communication. I'm looking to see, did they stay one or two years at a place and keep moving, or did they hunker down? And I'm looking to see what language skills or capability they'll bring to the practice that I don't have yet. The fact that somebody may speak a different language or may do something differently would add value uh, to us. But I'm looking always to make sure that people who join our practice um, fill up some of the blind spots that we have. And if they're right out of school, I give people a chance too. The law school that I teach in, uh, Cardoza Law School, has a RAMP program, which is called the Resident Associate Mentoring Program, where you take somebody straight out of school. And I reckon most lawyers have come to the conclusion right out of law school, they don't really know what it is that's going on and that they need to learn. And then we keep those talented students or we replenish with new students each year. You have a constitution in our nation that is much like a skeleton and the flesh on it is the new laws and the evolution of our nation's uh, heritage. It's no different in the business that constantly needs water and soil and light. And you have to constantly remind yourself that despite the fact that somebody may not know something, they come to the table with a worldly experience. So I'm not looking always for people um, as far as what schools they came from, but what kind of value they have, what kind of dignity they give, and what they have done as far as inquiring about our practice and how they see the next legacy or the next generation of the practice evolve also. I think that's very important. So what made you transition into this leadership role of mayor? Um, I also had an interest in public service, and it was something that ran uh, concurrent with my faith and my professional life. Uh, There are people in my faith, I'm a proud, observant Jew, uh, who have a real gestalt, including me, when I end up going to Jerusalem by the Western Wall. I feel the same sense of spirituality when I go to Washington, when I knock on doors in a local community and I'm resoundingly given the trust of a community to be their advocate. I take that responsibly. And it's, it's again, another area uh, that humbles you, uh, that you're given a title as mayor, or as a federal prosecutor when I had that, and you have a certain shelf life uh, to deliver. And that means that you actually have to step into the shoes of people more fortunate and less fortunate at all the same time and make good choices. And exercising uh, good judgment and reminding yourselves transparently that this trust is not yours, it belongs to somebody else, acting as if there's a wire being worn by every single person in front of me, and that I'm carrying the good name, the shame tov of my uh, grandfather, not just my father, pays uh, it forward in my actions so that I'll make my children proud by my activity. I raised uh, them and I was raised in a household where you had to do more than just for yourself, that there are no pockets in the shrouds when they put you down and you're going to leave behind something that can't be quantified or monetized and that is your name. Wow. So taking a step back, what is the journey like from just the average citizen to holding office in any sense? It's, um, it's, a, it's a diamond in the rough. I can tell you that I got involved when I was very young with the Auxiliary Police uh, Department, the NYPD in Manhattan, um, literally twirling a baton as the eyes and ears of the police department and walking and learning about people's stride and confidence and mannerisms and getting involved when they were facing challenges and protecting those that were vulnerable. To then getting involved when I was in uh, college and law school, not only working my dad's practice, but in other uh, community work. To then helping remove from the United States criminals that would want to cause people harm, deporting people, and then going into private practice as an immigration lawyer trying to protect people, give safe haven uh, to those in need show God's mercy at our borders, and to um, make sure that America did not compete internationally against the world's talent. It's foolhardy to think that the foreign students that are here and don't have a way to onboard into the workforce then become food for competition for us abroad rather than investing in those good souls while they're here. 
So from a business immigration, from a, a family immigration metric and so forth, I began to realize early on that the stronger I was in my law work, the better I would be as a mayor in listening and advocating. The more I listened and I advocated, my marriage was better because I listened to my children and to my wife according to what their needs were, not me. My wife was the biggest mentor in my life in that respect. Before Shabbat, the Sabbath, where it started on a Tuesday in my home where my mom would get the ingredients and quote-unquote hit the stores on a Thursday, and then Friday you're sitting there waiting to go to synagogue. My wife, two hours before the Sabbath, would run to the library with my daughter. And I'm in a panic. My wife comes back, and I said to her, are you okay? Is everything all right? She goes, numbskull. Do you understand? She's not the oldest daughter. She's not the youngest daughter, and she's not the only boy. She's a middle girl. You need to love a child according to their need. I'm back before the Sabbath, but I gave that child the love and the attention that she needed in the library independently of the way we perceive that we give love. And that was very impactful to me. And I think that if I'm stating that as a life-turning lesson, it's because I recognized at the very moment that it's good to be prepared for the Sabbath and to want to bring that uh, kudusha, that sanctity into your household but at the same time, it's so important that we give to others according to what their needs are, not what our perception is. And that ultimately is a stride that I take very seriously in public service. It's a trust and in law practice as well. So on the topic of giving, like what advice would you give to somebody? Okay, he wants to start giving something. What, uh, where would you start? Find something that interests you. I forever am telling uh, clients, law students that I mentor, Find something that you're interested in. You're interested in animals. You're interested in guitars. You're interested in something. Bring that into your professional world. Now, I didn't really love the law. Let me be honest with you. I loved my dad. But then I had to make the best of something that at times could be boring and unsettling. And you had no real chance sometimes in in changing. And then I started to get into some of the more sophisticated areas or the shades of gray, where there was no law. And then I began to realize because of our context, because of our scholarship, because of dad's legacy and the work that we've done, people were listening to us. And I stepped up and I testified on Capitol Hill. Now, I took my interest in public service and I added it into the law world and vice versa. Now, ethically, I have to always be sensitive to it to create a firewall between the two worlds that I'm not perceived to be profiting one for the other. But the bottom line is, if you are a person that's interested in music and entertainment or food or guitars, bring that into your profession world and become somebody who's an authority in that space so that you can effectively be doing what you love to do during the daytime. Just because it's work doesn't mean it can't be fun. Amen. Yeah. I so in the, in the law world, I mean, there are so many different routes you can go as a lawyer, different areas of the law that you can practice in. How would you recommend someone goes about figuring out what area of law they would either be best at practicing or would enjoy the most? I think it's the ruling out process. You have to figure on what you don't want to do in life. You have to rule things out so you don't spend valuable time after law school wasting what you could have done while you were in law school, college, or even high school. For those listeners that are listening, the process of elimination is a fun experience. Look, my dad's client, I told you, was John Lennon from the Beatles. He had a gorgeous song called Beautiful Boy. And life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. Beautiful stanza. Enjoy the journey. Enjoy the ride. This will be the last time. I went to college two days a week. Those other three days I rushed and worked in my dad's practice. I was so anxious to hold his briefcase and be there. If I had to do it all over again, maybe I would have done another day or two in college and taking classes that were peripherally not even related to what I wanted because that's your last chance to rule out things that you're interested in. Now, when you're getting into the law school profession or you're getting closer to the end of the run, you should start eliminating the things that you're interested in so you don't waste valuable time at a later time. Once you've come down and you've narrowed it, I want to be in a big firm, a small firm. I want to be in a firm where I have a little more life-work balance. I want to be involved in paper. No, I want to be involved in people. I I like research. I hate research. I want a transactional type business. No, I want a corporate more environment. You figure out early on where you would thrive. 
and then make it fun for yourself. Own it. So you mentioned the work-life balance. How do you juggle your your work, your life, and your I guess you know your connection to uh, to that upper power? I married up. I have to tell you that the most important uh, choices that you'll make are who you will marry more than what you will work in your lifetime. And if you marry up and you have somebody who makes you feel 10 feet tall and not six feet under, then you will find the right balance in life and you will balance your time properly. I have anywhere between six to 16 appointments a day. I do 15 minute meetings, I do calls, I do Skypes. I run between three law office locations and a fourth on occasion, New York, New Jersey, Miami, and LA. And I have an office at City Hall and I have obligations to cut ribbons, marry people, and make sure that I run with Hatzalah, which is a Jewish volunteer ambulance service as an EMT, because that's what I love to do on my spare time. The idea is to find balance, to make sure that you never have a spouse or a child saying, make time for me. I remember my mother, rest her soul, would book an appointment to see my father just to make time. And it was a joke at the time. Um, But I realized early on that the more quality time I spent with my wife and my kids, the more they supported me in all my other ventures. But you need to reboot. You have to be healthy. I make sure that I eat more properly as I get older and that I exercise at least one hour a week. I know it's completely inadequate, but I'm lucky if I discipline myself on food intake and I get the right amount of a quick charge sleep that I need, that I'll be uh, good to go. And then you have to make sure that you take care of those uh, hidden um, obligations also. If there's a family member that's not well, and some of the residents that I represent that are going through difficulty, I try to get birthday lists, and I try to make it possible so that I have, um, again, a sense of what I'm not engaged in and what should be an obligation of mine. So I run the office like a campaign, and I run the campaign like a law for office. I like that. So as a public servant, how do you make sure that you constantly are keeping tabs on what's going on with the community that's, you know, in your neighborhood that you're supposed to be taking care of, as well as making sure that you really understand them and and what they want? So understand that the city that I represent is so diverse. It's even impossible to represent all sides of the people at the same time um, and make everybody happy. But communication is key. The new experience of social media has made that much easier, made it more transparent, thankfully, but it's also made it more um, tumultuous because people can express their disdain just as quickly as their support. And you have to take sides, and it forces you. And if you can't take a side, and you have to be thoughtful or judicious because something is either proprietary or could lead to litigation, you have to be honest and open about that. So communication, using social media, and more importantly, knowing when not to speak, when literally just to be there, when there's a loss to somebody's family, just showing up, knocking on the door, and giving somebody a hug is more heartfelt than any words that you would use. Staying in touch with people and listening is half the job. I would venture to say that most of the community that put me in office disagreed with me at major or minor points of uh, difference, but respected the fact that I listened and that I showed up. Most of politics, most of professional life is actually being there and listening. Wow, that is powerful. Why don't you tell us some like books that you recommend or some any kind of personal development that that you've instilled inside your life that the audience can take on? So ultimately, I would urge everybody to read my book. Um, I'm 54 years old. I took about a year's time to pen it. It's uh, called Safe Haven in America, Battles to Open the Golden Door. The American Bar Association published it, and it's located on Amazon. I penned a lot of the anecdotes and the entrepreneurial uh, notions that kept me uh, in my um, in my lane, and some of the inspiration that got me going. Uh, my father also wrote a book on the Lennon case uh, called John Lennon versus the USA. Also, the Bar Association 
uh, published it at a time when enrollment in law school was going down and they wanted to encourage people. My father had no idea who John Lennon was, and he was then credited with John with opening up prosecutorial discretion and this whole DACA, about 900,000 young people now have a status in this country because of the legacy of that case. So it's important for people to kind of see the evolution of my father, a young man who turned into a scholar, and then his next generation son, who is managing this obligation and taking it to more states and a different level. I hope, uh, God willing, two of my four kids are in law school, that both will one day want to carry the mantle, but I'll be just as proud and love them just as much um, if they didn't come into the practice. Other books that I uh, think are useful are all the entrepreneurial uh, books, including The Entrepreneurial Way, penned by, of course, you, Mr. Bassani, and others that I, uh, through the years, uh, believe are snapshots in time of leadership. I think it was a shocking experience to some of the people in the office that they were no longer looking for my father or my partner, but they were looking for me. Now, the media may create that facade, but the media also creates an opportunity for you to get to know people. So more than just reading books, find people that you one day would want to emulate and do a deep dive on them. Read their books, read their writings, watch them on YouTube and on television, read up on the reviews of how they conduct themselves, and then break that down. I used to watch old movies when I was a kid, and I was stunned how films were two, uh, two hours, two and a half hours. The dialogue, the depth, the twists, and the plots was so much more meaningful than what we see in Hollywood producing these days. Yes, Netflix and everybody has this great inventory of content and the great visuals, but when it came to the depths of character, the use of words, an oratory experience, when I hear a term of art, I have a little file that I actually write them in, and they're talking points uh, for me, because I think words are impactful. Not just reading them, but learning how to get fluent with them, and then finding how finding a mentor in your life. It could be a book, it could be a person that you admire, but you need to find somebody. I have every week a young person in my office, multiply sometimes. They sign confidentiality documents and they sit with me for a few hours to see what it's like to be a lawyer. These are high school kids, college, and sometimes law school students or lawyers who believe they made mistakes in their field. And I invite them just to get a little snapshot and to see a little difference of how I practice and others in our firm do also. So read on, as I would say. Um, Dad's book is a hell of a lot more fun and has an audio tape than mine. Wow, beautiful. So we ask the famous question before we end. In your opinion, what is the difference between the entrepreneur and a power entrepreneur? I think a, uh, a power entrepreneur is a person who does a deeper dive and works it until it gets done. An entrepreneur may have all the trimmings and may have had either good fortune or good instinct, but a power entrepreneur is somebody who does a deep dive, who questions themselves and delivers more than what's expected. You make a buck, that's good, but if you define yourself by the buck, you're not going to make it in this world, and you're not going to serve as a mentor for somebody else. If you recognize, as I did at a very young age, that you have a certain shelf life to have an influence, and you make this world stronger by your influence, and you leave behind children or those that would want to emulate it, that's a far more rewarding entrepreneurship than anything else. That is powerful. That is powerful right there. <laughs> so how can the audience reach out to you if they have questions? Look or... out for my website, which is my last name in the word law, so it's wildslaw.com. Um, my Facebook page, I think, is robust. It's the mayor page. Um, it's like mayor, author, professor, and whatever. Uh, Michael Wilds again, and um, Instagram. I'm not so hot on, but I have people that make sure that they that these things are are out there. Uh, getting my book and being in touch with me, where I could be of service in any way, whether it's immigration or public service or just a listening uh, ear and a shoulder, is uh, is really my privilege. And I again appreciate the time that you've given me. Um, I hope to have a lot more to say as my hair turns yet another shade of white. Uh, and uh, and as I enjoy uh, this time in my uh, practice life with my father, and I see my children turning the corner and graduating law school, I'm very prayerful 
uh, for what holds uh, for the future, not just for them, but for this country, this country that is the facilitator of not only entrepreneurs, uh, but America's golden doors have seen the likes of no other um, plateau and achievements. And that is just something we all have to take stock and pride in. Thank you very much for joining us on the podcast. Pleasure.